out on the patio, come on in. Run for cover But the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven I believe in signs and wonders I have resurrection power Still the miracle that I just can't get over
lift our voice this morning. praise because you deserve it all. What amazing truth that is this morning. Thank you to our awesome worship group who give us this opportunity to declare before God that he deserves everything. The highest praise. My name is Mandy Cato and I'm the Next Steps pastor here at Harbour Point and I have the joy this morning of welcoming all of you. I've already met some of you who are here for the first time and to you, you get a special welcome and I know some of you have already been to the starting point for our gift and so I can tell you about all the great things we have happening at Harbour Point. Things like Alpha, which is an eight-week course. They were just in week three. And it's so fun. We have three large groups of people from all ages, 17 all the way up to more than 17. And 
people are asking questions there. It's a safe place for them to ask questions about faith and about eternity and about life and spirituality. And we're able to give them this great group and this video curriculum and a free dinner every week because of the generosity of people like you. The other thing I'm really excited about is our sermon series right now, These Strange Words. As well as working here, I get to teach in the Biblical Studies Department at Biola University. And so I am very excited that as a church, we are digging into the Bible and we're looking at how did it come to be? Who wrote it? And how do we explain some of the strange words we find in the Bible? And how do we apply them to our lives? This approach to biblical knowledge and honoring the Bible is one of the reasons that my husband and I chose to come to this church. And it's one of the reasons that we choose to give You'll see up on the screen opportunities for you to give, to step into this ministry with a regular online donation or a one-off gift. And maybe God is calling you today to step in in a new way, in a bigger way. Shall we pray together? Father God, thank you that you deserve all of our praise. You deserve our resources and our time. And Lord, I pray that today, through your Holy Spirit, we would be fully present in this service, listening out for what you have to say to us and being part of this amazing church. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I want to sing a new song together this morning, and this song has been on repeat for me for this whole year, and I've been waiting for the perfect time to sing it together. It's helped me see and experience God's consistent character in every part of life, and it's given me hope for the good things and the good future that he has. So I want to sing this chorus, teach you this chorus. It's simple, it's beautiful. It goes like this. I've witnessed your faithfulness. I've seen you breathe life with it. So I'll pour out my praise again. You're worthy. God, you're worthy of all of it. Your promise is never stories I live to tell, so I'll pour out my praise again. You're worthy, God, you're worthy of all of it. Try and sing that with me, sing of this faithfulness. I've witnessed your faithfulness. I've seen you breathe life with me, so I'll pour out stories I live to tell, so I'll pour out my praise again. You're worthy, God, you're worthy of all of it. 
you're constant, I've witnessed it, and I'm confident, I'll see it again and again, you love and I've witnessed it, you heal and I've witnessed it, you save and I've witnessed it, and I'm confident. that you heal, that you love, that you're our savior, that you rose from the dead, that we can point to the cross and say we've witnessed love like never before. God, we just give you our praise and we give her our thanks this morning. And at the same times, God, we come to you with our prayers, things we're crying out to you for, circumstances that need to change, health that needs to change. And with a collective faith here, we say, because we've seen it before, because you're always the same, we know you'll do it again, God. So would you bring healing? Would you bring hope? Would you bring comfort this morning, God, as we bring you our praise, as we bring you our prayers, we come to you with everything we have, God. We come to you with our faith this morning. And it's in your powerful name, Jesus, we pray all these things. And everybody said, Amen, amen. Oh, I love singing that song with you. So good. So good. Why don't you greet a few people around you? Say hello, say good morning. You can take a seat. Welcome to Harbor Point. I'm Becky and I'm the junior high pastor here. It is so good to be together today. Whether you're watching with us online, here with us on campus, welcome. We are so glad that you've chosen to spend part of your weekend with us. And if you're new here, you should know this. We are a church of imperfect people without all of the answers, where all are welcomed, all are challenged, and all are loved by God. So wherever you are in your spiritual journey, just know that you're welcomed here. If you have a junior high student, we wanna let you know that one of the best things that we do all year is just around the corner, summer camp. And this year we are headed to Hume SoCal from June 12th through the 17th. And it is not too late to sign up. 
Camp is one of the best ways for your students to get connected here, hands down. From making friends, to getting to know their leaders and staff, to just having some time away from their busy schedules, to have fun and grow deeper in their relationship with God. It is a week filled with incredible worship, powerful speakers, and fun activities. You don't want your student to miss out on this awesome experience. You can register your student online or through the link on the screens in the chairs in front of you. Another highlight of summer is our Summer Nights VBS. And with the end of the school year quickly approaching, we know that you might be starting to make your summer plans. We want to make sure that you save the date for our annual week-long camp for kindergartners through fifth grade. Each night, kids are going to experience lessons from the Bible and live worship. They will enjoy dinner, crafts, and games, and learn about opportunities to serve. You won't want your kids to miss it. So save the date for Summer Nights VBS on July 10th through the 14th. Well, thanks so much for being with us today. Follow us at harborpoint.church to stay connected throughout the week. It is so good to be together as we continue in our series, These Strange Words. All right, hey everybody, good morning. Good to see you guys. Hope you're doing well. If, you, uh, if you're new with us, glad you made it here. I know there's lots of, lots of places you could be on Sunday morning. We're really grateful that you're with us. I hope that you find very, very quickly that... Um, as we talk about it a lot around here, we don't have all the answers. We don't have it all figured out. As a community of people, we're aiming our lives at Jesus. And um, as far as that goes, we know that nobody does that perfect. And so we need each other to do it. And we need each other to, and watch this way. Everybody has a next step and we need each other to kind of help us do that together. If you're outside in the tent, welcome. Glad you're with us. Those of you who are joining us online, also great to have you with us. Those of you guys who made it here, obviously the best expression of our church community is when we get a chance to be together. And I gotta tell you this, just to prepare you right, right out of the gate, this talk, I, I broke a record in terms of the number of slides that we've had. Never had this many slides. And at some, I'll give you fair warning. So I just want to tell you, there's going to be a moment where I'm going to go, this is, it's going to get even more like, you're going to be like, is there, are we going to keep going like this? And the answer is yes, it will get worse. And then I'll promise I will land a plane. But you will be thinking, my goodness, where is this going? And then I promise I'll land the plane. Okay, cool. Everybody ready? Okay, let's start with some critical questions. First of all, uh, let's just start with this critical area thing. And this is just, I'm just going to do this fast. But things people admit to not understanding. So these are things, I'm just going to give you a list of things people admit to not understanding. But they may not always admit it in every circumstance, but they admit it every so often. And here's a couple things. First of all, people will talk about it, but not understand. Stock market. Oh, yeah, stocks are up and down. People are selling and buying crazy. And what, what does that mean? I don't know, but I know we should worry about it. I mean, that's people, some of you get that. You're in finance. You're like, I get it. You should ask me. In fact, here's my card. Okay, put your card down. Uh, but... <laughs> A lot of people are like, I know I'm supposed to care about that and it has some, in, some effect on or whatever, but I, and I know when it's bad, it's bad. That's all we know. Okay, great. Now, things people admit to not knowing, not understanding. Why fridge has a D, but refrigerator doesn't. <laughs> Crippling questions for your life. Things that you're like, I cannot go another day unless I know the answer to this question. And nobody has an answer for that question. We just don't know. Uh, some of you might be familiar with this. The order of emails in a thread of emails. <laughs> Or it's like, am I in, if you answer the middle email, where does that rank the next email? And you cannot find it, especially in a big group. It's like, forget it. I don't know. Just text me. I don't know. Okay. Uh, things people don't admit to not understanding. Dry cleaning. <laughs> Great mystery of the universe. It's just, they, there's a sorcerer in the back somewhere. It's just, bring over your stains and they're gone. How do you dry clean things? Other things people don't understand. Electricity. Just, it's there. All, most, some of you, you understand how electricity works. The rest of us are like, it's a switch. We just turn it on and then it's on and then it's not there and it's off. We don't know how it works. We just know that it's there. And the last thing, the, mo the thing people admit to not understanding is just part of our world is dogs with bangs. <laughs> yeah, people are just like, I don't know what to do with that. But that's just a, <laughs> that's a thing, people. <laughs> now, those are a lot of things. There's probably a lot more. I know that's the critical one you were thinking about today. <laughs> It's amazing how the expressions of these two match exactly, but nevertheless, uh, things are things that fall in the category of things we, we accept without the burden of understanding. We're just like, these are things that are there. We just don't have to, we don't, I mean, some, some, for some reason or another, we're like, this is just part of our world we'll never understand. And to some extent, right, there's some stuff we don't understand and will not accept. And there's stuff like this where it's like, this is some stuff we accept and we know we'll never understand it. And the problem for us is if we think a thing ought to be understood but isn't, that's where it starts to get a little, we start to get pretty frustrated. And more so, I would say even more specifically, when we think we specific, ourselves, when we think we should understand a thing but we don't understand it. It's okay that we don't understand a lot of things as long as someone understands it. But if nobody understands it, that's, understands it, that's a problem. And if we don't understand it, that's a problem as well. 
And few things fit that category better than the Bible. Last week, we started a series called These Strange Words. And as we talk about the Bible, it's, you know, 66 books comprised over about 1,500 or so years with roughly 40 authors. And then there's, you know, it's written to an ancient Near Eastern people. And the Bible itself is written in, in a world that's unrecognizable to us. And so the world, the words, I'm sorry, the words are strange. Even if you're a Christian, even if you're like, I'm in for the Bible, I'm in for Jesus, even for us, it still feels a bit strange. And even when the Bible says things like this, all scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness and so on. We, we read things like this, and for a lot of us Christians, we're like, we agree with that. The Bible is inspired, God-breathed, it's authoritative for our life, all that stuff. But that doesn't make it any easier to understand in some instances. And for a skeptic, when the, like I told you my story, how I asked the question last week, if you're with us, I told you, I asked this question, well, like, when I asked, how do I believe the Bible? Why should I trust it? And someone told me that they just quoted this verse for me, and I was like, well, that's not a self-evident proof that a Bible says it's, it's inspired God's word. It, it is the inspired authoritative word of God. And I'm like, but lots of other faiths would say that about their writing, I would imagine, too. They would say it's inspired or God-breathed or whatever. So what separates our particular thing, even though I believe it, why is it that I believe it? So for those of you on any, all, all ends of the spectrum, whether you're skeptical about the Bible, someone brought you, or you're someone who's been walking with Jesus for a long time, you've been around the church for a long time, you know your Bible inside and out, the truth is, for a lot of us, it's still a little bit tricky to understand. Now, prominent, this would not be surprising to you, prominently featured in the Bible, again, this will, whether or not you're a church person or not, you're not going to be surprised by this, prominently featured in the Bible is this person called Jesus of Nazareth. Wow, I know, shocking stuff. Already, shocking truth number seven. Okay, now, and what is, what, so what's not surprising even further is that people tend to like Jesus. There's lots of people who I'm like, I like Jesus, but I'm not so sure about the Bible. You might be that person who's like, look, I like Jesus. The Bible, I do not, I don't even, I, I'm just not in for that. But what might even be more surprising, and this is the first sort of seatbelt moment for you this morning. I'm just going to just get ready for it. I'm going to say it, and then I'm going to I'll help you understand it, but get ready. The, what might be more surprising than that is... People don't believe in Jesus because they believe in the Bible. You're like, that's exactly why I believe in Jesus. That's not true. Okay, bear with me. People don't believe in Jesus because they believe in the Bible. People believe in the Bible because they believe in Jesus. Now, all that to say is, and I'm gonna, I don't have a, a lot of time to really unpack all of this, except to say this. The Bible, even if you don't believe in it as God's word, even if you don't believe in it as God's word, which the reason why we believe in it as God's word is because of Jesus, but if you, even if you don't believe, it, believe in it as God's word, it's still reliable. In fact, as a historical document, the Bible stacks up against almost every other ancient document, in many cases way, way better in terms of its reliability, in terms of what it's reporting. Now you, like I said, you may not believe all the Bible, but you like Jesus, so let's do this. Let's just start backwards. We'll start at Jesus and work our way backwards. Because most people, it turns out, they kind of like Jesus. They're just not sure about the Bible. So let's just start at Jesus and work our way backwards. Now, some of you will ask the question, fair question, how do I know if Jesus is even real? Some of you are like, look, maybe for a lot of you, you're just kind of encountering this stuff. You're like, there's a whole faith system developed. And then some people later on had to go, wait, 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 we got to make it fit. So let's read that. Let's read Jesus back into this and make this fit because he's not really a real person. He just, you know, we, someone made him up. In fact, his name means God saves. Isn't that a little bit too handy? I mean, that's just literally like a lot of people think. Now, that said, Jesus' existence is historically inarguable. I mean, no matter what you think, now he may not be who he says he is. That's up for debate. You can talk about that. But in terms of Jesus' actual existence, historically inarguable. Uh, one writer, we taught, we, he's one of the books we recommend every so often. Um, a book is called The Problem of Jesus. Again, Mark Clark, we talked about him last year. But here's what, uh, here's what he says. We'd be able to construct the following picture of Jesus from secular history alone. So these are not people who are like, I'm all about Jesus. These are people who are outside of the community of people who follow Jesus. This is the research from secular history alone. Jesus was a Jewish teacher. People believed he performed miracles and exorcism. He believed he was the Messiah. He was tried and crucified under this governor named Pontius Pilate as a criminal during the reign of Caesar Tiberius. And despite his death, his followers believed he was still alive and worshipped him as God. Now, again, he's not saying, he's not saying the secular sources are affirming all of those things. They're just simply saying all of, the, all, all of the community of people who follow Jesus, this is what they believed, and here's what's reported about this person, Jesus, which means he existed. So we have this person who did exist named Jesus of Nazareth, who did generate a following. And some of you will say, yeah, 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 okay, cool, there's this person, Jesus. Yes, there's a Jesus, there's a Jesus, but he's not the one of the Bible. There's a, because there's a diff, there's, yes, there's a person named Jesus, he's from Nazareth, okay, but he's not the one in the Bible. In fact, what you hear a lot is, and this might be you, 
People like the Jesus of the Bible, there's like powerful men who constructed a version of Jesus to advance their political agendas. And any kind, anytime there was sort of a contradictory version of this person of Jesus or the community of people who followed him, then they just silenced it to kind of advance their own political stuff. And so the Bible, in essence, is a fabricated document with sort of with, that was made or constructed for a political power grab. And that's the Jesus that we got. A lot of people think that. One of the books we're recommending during the series is a book called Why Trust the Bible. Some of you grabbed the copy. We have a couple, I think, still in the lobby. You can take a look at it. But here's what one scholar says. She says, look, this is by Amy Orr Ewing. On the whole, the New Testament books, New Testament is the part of the Bible which includes Jesus' life and ministry. It includes a little bit of the early church and some letters that get circulated among the early church and so on, other stuff too. But on the whole, the New Testament books made their way into the church naturally. So this is to say not by some powerful group of people who are trying to manipulate it. They were accepted from the time they were written by the apostles and evangelists in the church across the world. Those books that were questioned were not accepted or rejected because of a fiat, that's to say an official decree. They're not accepted or rejected because of an official decree by a group of powerful men. Rather, a consensus emerged in the church from the earliest times, either recognizing the authority of a book or rejecting it. In other words, it's a pretty democratic process. The church community that forms in the ancient, or the, the ancient Near East, yeah, there's all of these folks are spreading around and they're starting to talk about this person of Jesus and people who never met Jesus but are reading and understanding who this person is, they start circulating these letters that have a consistent message and have sort of this overlapping kind of thing and people are like, this is what we're constructing, we're calling this the way in which these church communities begin and people aren't writing, they aren't sitting down to write the Bible. A lot of times they're just writing an account of a thing or they're telling a thing or they're writing a letter and they're sharing it among these churches and all of a sudden this group of people begins to start saying, I think this is how we ought to kind of, we ought, this is the way a church ought to run because it's consistent across the board. And so you get, when it, we start talking about the New Testament inclusion criteria, here's what they are, how these things became the Bible. First of all, were they widely used? Were lots of different churches in lots of different contexts taking letters that might have been written to one church going, you know, this might have some value in some other churches, how they handle a situation, Right? Then you have, or an account of Jesus, then you have the apostolic authorship, meaning was it written by an, by an apostle? Someone who's got the highest level of leadership, had an encounter with the risen Jesus, all of that stuff. We go, that person, we should trust their leadership. And lastly, is the message sort of in alignment with everything else that's already been written? Like nobody's giving us like all of a sudden a wild curveball. It's like, wow, nobody else is saying that. We're going with that. So in essence, what you have is this group of people by the fourth century who are like, like we got to figure out, all these people have been using the same kind of stuff which meant nobody could then offer an alternative form of Jesus. Like, no other faith system could say, we're the true version of Christianity, and this is the true version of Jesus, because it would be tested against these things. It's still valuable today when someone else says, I have a new version of Jesus. It's like, well, does it, meet, does it even meet this criteria? So you get all of this stuff, meaning it wasn't just a group of powerful men who were like, we've decided now what the Bible should be. The people decided it, and then it was like, we got to make sure that nobody else tries to add anything else as soon as all of the wide usage and everything else was kind of happening. So it was really a democratic process in a lot of ways. Now, regarding liking Jesus and the Bible, we eventually have to run into this question. Because a lot of you will say, I like Jesus, I just don't, the Bible, so, and I get that. The question you're going to have to run into eventually is, what did, how did Jesus regard the Bible? What did he think about the Bible? You have the Bible, you have Jesus, and then you have the question of what did Jesus think about the Bible itself? And this is where it starts to get a little bit more uncomfortable if you're a person who likes Jesus but not the Bible, because here's what Jesus says about it. Matthew 5, 17. Famously, Jesus says, Do not think I've come to abolish, that is to say, get, a, get rid of, the law or the prophets, that's to say, the whole Hebrew Scriptures. Don't think I've come to abolish the law or the prophets, the Hebrew Scriptures. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Now, why that's a problem is all of a sudden you have this person of Jesus who doesn't just see the, like, he doesn't just like the Bible and think it's good. He's actually saying, everything that the Hebrew scriptures are pointing to is going to be fulfilled in me. I'm the person who's going to make all that stuff come together. I'm the culminating moment, which means he's got more than just the high value of it. He's the continuation of the story that starts in the Hebrew scriptures, and it comes to fulfillment in him. So all of a sudden you've got a problem if Jesus is just a person who you like, but you don't like the scripture because Jesus has a pretty high value of it. Furthermore, around the, if you've been around the church or you've read enough or you maybe you've asked the question, even if you just sort of, you just sort of been around it, even in sort of a, like a, sort of a distant sense, you've kind of been aware of there's this, there's this sort of, there's, this, there's something that seems critical to Jesus' mission to fulfill. Like the thing that he's here to do 
and it falls into the category for a lot of people because you hear it a lot. It falls into the category of, I'm just going to accept this without understanding it. And that's where most of us will start. That's where I started when I was in junior high. I told you this was kind of my story. But it is also one of the most problematic things for me. When I was early on in sort of investigating my own faith and kind of like, okay, is this for real? This is one of the things people said all the time that I generally just put in the category of, I'm just going to accept it even though I don't understand it. And to say now that you're going to understand it perfectly, that is what we talk about it, is, that's, that's just not true. But I'll just give you at least a sense of the way the Bible works with this statement that all of you have seen, but maybe never really thought about why it works. Here it is. This statement, Jesus died for our sins. Amen. Amen. Okay, we're done. There we go. Let's just wrap it up. That was it. There we go. <laughs> now, the statement is everywhere, and it's so common. Most of us are like, we just don't question it. I was walking by uh, upstairs, you know, uh, this week. Uh, there was, uh, their kids are writing down things that they're, they're counting their blessings. And one, someone wrote, a kid wrote with kind of really wonderful sort of primary grade writing, Jesus died for our sins. And I'm like, way to go. So we, underst- we understand that it's a thing we ought to believe, but understanding how it all works is a, was a problem for me. And here's why it was a problem. I wanted to understand the mechanism of how it worked. Here's Jesus, an innocent guy. He's killed, and I'm like, that's tragic. I get that. And then everybody in the church that I ever talked to, I was like, then they just made this jump. This innocent guy died on a cross. He wasn't the only person who died on a cross. Romans executed a lot of people on crosses. But here's this guy who died on a cross, and they were like, and then he died for our sins. And I was like, seems like we jumped a lot there. Like, there's a guy who died, and all of a sudden, thank you for dying. I didn't understand that. And I just, I, for me, that was always an issue. And I just want to tell you, how that became a thing was a big deal, and Christians claim it, and I was like, did we just put that back into the story, or is there something else to it? Now, here's what I'm going to do. For the remainder of our time, you're going to drink from a fire hose, okay? It is going to come at you, and you're going to be like, whoa, slow it down. Can we turn off the pre- water pressure? I don't have time to turn off the water pressure, so get comfortable, because it's going to be uncomfortable for a little bit. And I have to tell you, if you're also a person who's a bit squeamish, the only way to tell this story is by using the word blood a lot, which you're going to be like, really? So if that's you, and you're like, I don't know if I can handle this. You know what? I get it. Grab a donut. We'll see you guys later, okay? Just because that's what I got to talk about, okay? Now, so are, are we okay? Are we ready for this? Okay. So here's a lot of ways they could tell the story. I'm going to do this relatively quickly, and we're going to try to make this work. Here we go. In Genesis chapter 15, so remember, I'm going to circle, fire hose, the plane will land. That's a lot of metaphors. They're all mixing, but here we go. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 15, after this, the word of the Lord came to Abram. Abram will eventually be called Abraham, um, and it came to him in a vision. After this, by the way, Abram and a couple of his buddies, they go, like a couple hundred people, they go actually, they, they steal back some goods that were taken from them, from local it says they're kings. They're not necessarily kings of a whole land of people. It's more like this kings of a city or kings of a town. But anyway, they go back and they steal back some stuff and they're worried. So here's what God says to them. Don't be afraid, Abram. I'm your shield, your very great reward. Okay, so again, skipping forward, I'm going to go quick. Uh, then uh, God says to him, he took Abram outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. So God takes Abram out to, oh, by the way, I should say this. Um, in the ancient Near East, Blessing, which is to say that you can tell that God's favor is upon you, the, the life of happiness and fullness, that's whatever that is. Blessing is always tied at least to two things. And one of those things is offspring, the number of descendants that you have, and then also the land that you can possess. So God says, don't worry, go up, count the stars. So shall your offspring breed. Abram is like, whatever, you, the, for one, <laughs> I want pass, I think this is the best way to describe it. Abram is like great grandpa age. Just he's like an old dude, okay? So whatever, if you think that's you and you're a great-grandpa, this is him. Okay, now, so Abram believed the Lord and he credited to him his righteousness. So God says, you're going to have, count the stars if you could do it, as if you could do it. You're going to have that many off, that's how many descendants you're going to have. Abram's like, I'm a pretty old guy. And he's like, you know, but nevertheless, Abram believed it, uh, believed it, believed the Lord and credited to him his righteousness. So there you go, descendants. This is part of the blessing. Next verse. He also said to him, I'm the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. So descendants, now we have land to take possession of it. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, how can I know I'll gain possession of it? So you're going to have descendants like the stars, old man. I believe it. I'm going to give you some land. How do I know? What happens next are some very strange words. How do I know that I can trust you, God? So the Lord said to him, get ready for this. I'm really worried, God. I don't know if this is actually going to happen. And God says, bring me a a heifer, a cow. Bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, with a dove and a young pigeon. Okay, so I was just saying I was worried about, like, if this was going to work out, bring me some animals. We're on the same page, right, God, about the whole blessing thing, about this, right? Now, notice what happens next. Abram 
brought all these things to him. Okay, God, I'm doing this. And then without being instructed, he does the most bizarre thing. You and I will be like, what in the world is happening? Abram brought all these to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. God, I'm worried about if I'm actually going to get this land. Bring me some animals. Okay. And then Abram just starts cutting a cow in half. Whatever, how long that must have taken. I mean, it's the most gory horror thing you've ever seen in your life. And it's happening. And it's like, what is going on now? For the people who, the original audience of this, everybody right away would have been like, oh my gosh, God is so good. This is so great. We're like, what in the world is going on? Because what they would have understood immediately is that what God is doing with Abram is entering into something called the covenant. Now, you and I, the only word, the only sort of similarity to covenant that we have to the ancient Near East, it's, and it's, now it's kind of, it's a little bit sort of reduced, but it still matters. It's the most similar thing as marriage. We're used to contracts, which are different. That preserves the individual rights of a person. But a covenant is about an agreement, a sacred agreement about the both people, both parties, a mutual sort of one for the other, I give myself to you kind of idea. In a covenant, which is a sacred bond or agreement, there's also mutual obligations, and then it's always ratified by an oath or vows, like in a wedding ceremony. Now, in this particular instance, you have, so all of us are like, couldn't they have, they could have just, you know, like said yes and vowed to do something? What's that about? Remember, this is in the ancient Near East. So the words are strange to us, but not to people in the ancient Near East. It's common practice that people would enter into covenants all the time. Here's the way it's described in some, in some research. Here we go. In order to promote greater cohesion among members of a tribe or a clan, or a nation, as well as to encourage greater cooperation between nations, the ancients often formed binding agreements called covenants. An integral part of a covenant was the ritual slaughtering of an animal and the pronouncement of a formula. So we're going to enter into an agreement that's a sacred agreement of love and trust or whatever. The way that we enter into that agreement was often accompanied by the slaughtering of an animal. And then this is what happens. Here's the formula. Just as this beast is cut up, so may X, the participant in the covenant may also be cut up. Like, might this happen to me if I don't hold up my end of this covenant agreement? Most likely the parties making the covenant thereby declared that whoever might break the agreement would be likewise, would likewise be killed. So God is like, look, Abram's like, I'm worried about the land. And God's like, no, no, get me some animals. And Abram's like, yes, this is going to be a covenant agreement. God's going to own up to his part. I got to own up to my part. That's great. I'm in for this. And what would happen in the ancient Near East, some people would have an agreement of this kind of level of covenant. What they would do is walk in between these animals, which are split apart. So you have these animals. It's a gory thing, right? It's gnarly. Then there are all these people apart. They'd walk in and they would have the agreement in the midst of the animals, assuming that this was the formula then. Might this happen to me if I don't live up to my end of the bargain? Okay, some of you are like, the plane is really circling and I don't understand what's going. Stay with me. Skipping down a little bit. So Abram spends all day, imagine, having to cut these animals in half and set this up. He goes, into a, he goes into a sleep. Here's what he sees. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot and a, with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. Now let me say really quickly. Anytime you see that God's presence is represented, what's called his manifest presence, his up-close presence among the people, it's often represented as fire or smoke or something like that. And so here you have the fire which is appearing and passing between the pieces. And on that day... The Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I give this land. Now, what you have to understand. There's an agreement. All, now, what's critical to understand here is, in a typical, like we talked about, a typical ancient Near Eastern covenant ceremony, people would walk in together. Two parties would meet in the middle. Only in this case, you have only one party meeting in the middle. What that means then, you have God's presence in the middle of these two things, which means that God's, God's intending to demonstrate to Abraham, or Abram at this point, God will bear the responsibility for both parties in the covenant agreement. That means it's not so that if Abraham or his descendants fail, it's God who takes the penalty upon himself. Now, that being said, some of you are like, that's Abraham's descendants. Abraham has a, has a kid, J, you know, Isaac, and Isaac has two kids, Jacob and Esau. Jacob changes his name to Israel. Israel has 12 sons, become the 12 tribes of Israel. And you're like, that's great for people who will later call themselves Jews. But what does that mean for us? The Bible will tell us that people who follow Jesus are grafted into that family, which, means, which makes us by faith descendants of Abraham as well. If Abraham and his descendants should fail in their ability to uphold their end of the bargain, the covenant agreement, then God will take on the penalty for himself somehow. 
Fast forward 500 years, fire hose still coming at you. Here we go. Fast forward 500 years, Moses is leading, he's charged with leading God's people out of captivity in Egypt. One of the ways God rescues his people is by sending multiple plagues to come over the land of Egypt until God's people are rescued out of captivity. The last plague is a plague that's intended to take out the firstborn of all of the livestock and the people and everything else. But God gives, them a, God gives his people a solution, and here's what it is. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. Take care of them, the lambs, until the 14th day of the month when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. I know, it's a lot of blood. Then they're there to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. And on the same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals. And I'll bring judgment on the gods of Egypt. Side note, the Pharaoh, the king of, the king of Egypt, regards himself as a god. I'll bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is celebrated in the spring. It's called Passover. You might have heard of it. Now, by the way, I should say this. So we'll keep on going for, for a moment here. There's an innocent lamb that's killed. A perfect, no, done nothing wrong. Innocent lamb is killed. Blood placed it on the doorpost. Death passes over. And note, some of you might be going, look, I don't believe this. This is so far-fetched, I don't believe this. I just want to remind you, Jesus does believe this, and he actually sees himself as part of this story. Again, problematic to like Jesus, but not like the Bible. It's just, you have an intellectual issue there. There's another Jewish holiday. Let me skip forward a little bit. It's the most sacred, most sacred day in the Jewish calendar. It's called Yom Kippur, the, the Day of Atonement. Here's how it works. The high priest shall slaughter the goat. There's two goats being offered here. One's going to be killed here. The high priest shall then slaughter the goat for the sin offering for the people, and he shall sprinkle it on the atonement cover and in front of the atonement cover. In the, in the tent of meeting, this is, which will eventually become the temple, there's, a, there's an inner part of it, an inner, inner part called the Holy of Holies. In there is the Ark of the Covenant. If you guys ever saw, Ark is just a word that means box or container. You guys ever saw Indiana Jones, the Raiders of the Lost Ark? There you go, okay? Now, on top of that is a lid. There's like angel wings that come over it like this. It's really ornate and beautiful. And in that middle, where the angel's wings kind of meet in the middle, that spot right there is called the mercy seat. And this is where this is being sprinkled. So there's, there's blood being sprinkled on that place called the mercy seat, or the atonement cover. Uh, by the way, the word atonement means covering. So you're with me here. Uh, and this way he will make atonement for the most holy place because of the uncleanness and the rebellion of the Israelites, whatever their sins have been. This is about the Israelite, the, all of the people's sins. The high priest is to lay both, oh, sorry, let me back up real quick. That being said, all of, the, all of the people's sins are being covered by this sacrifice, again, of an innocent animal, blood being spilled on the place called the mercy seat. Skipping forward a little bit, the second goat. The high priest is to lay, hand, lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites, all their sins, and put them on the goat's head. So there's this other goat, and the, the high priest puts his hands on the goat's head and confesses all the, sin, the sins of the people and says, this is, we're putting all the sins on this goat. He shall send the goat away into the wilderness in the care of someone appointed for the task. That goat has another name. You've heard of it before. You just didn't know where it comes from. That goat is called the scapegoat. That's where it actually comes from. So all of the burden of all of the people's blame, sin, is put on this goat and it's sent away, taking the sin away from the people. So this goat is like a sin sponge that just wanders into the wilderness away from the people. To recap, God and Abraham make a covenant. God bears the burden for both parties, leaving Abraham to not have to bear the burden of being faithful to the covenant. And if you read the Bible, it turns out, people, human beings, we're not great at upholding our end of the bargain with God. But God bears the weight of both of those things. Death passes over in the, what we now call Passover, an innocent lamb with blood on the doorposts, right? Then you have the covering of sin on the Day of Atonement. People, the blood covers over the people's sins, all the people's sins, and then there's the scapegoat, which all the people's sins are placed on that goat, and it carries the sin away from the people, it takes the sin away. Now, are you with me? What's happening here? Jesus is seeing himself as the fulfillment of this story. John the baptizer, or John the Baptist, will say this in John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day, John the baptizer saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God, innocent Lamb, killed, so death passes over. Happens the same time as we celebrate Easter. Lamb of God, 
who takes away the sin of the world like this other goat who takes, absorbs sin onto himself and takes it away from the people into the wilderness. Then Jesus in his own words will say this a couple chapters later in John. You study the scriptures diligently because you think in them that you'll have eternal life. He's talking to his critics who are like, we're all about the scriptures and you're kind of this wild person who's saying these things. And then here's what he says right in their face. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. All of the Hebrew scriptures, they're just pointing to me. And yet you refuse to come to me to have life. Jesus saw his whole ministry as a culmination of the Bible. The whole thing, everything was wrapped up into this person of Jesus. Everything, all the Hebrew scriptures pointed to this moment. And we don't have much choice then about the, to like Jesus and not really so much the Bible because of the way Jesus regarded the Bible. Either Jesus was a person who was really kind of out of his mind in terms of being a liar. Like, you know, I'm just making this whole thing up and seeing what I can get going. It kind of backfires on him because eventually he gets killed on a Roman cross. He could be a person who just genuinely believes this, but he's out of his mind. Like he's generally, I mean, the only way to say is he's he's just insane. He believes he's a person that he's not. And people are like, no, you're not insane. You're the thing. That's possible. But you really can't get away with him just sort of being a wonderful personality who says nice things about being kind to the poor. Because he sees himself as the culmination of this whole story. The whole thing pulls together in this moment. And so we look back at the Bible and go, oh, this is why we believe all of the Bible. Because Jesus is that person. He can't just be sort of a nice guy who says wonderful things. Some of you are like, okay, I think I kind of, I sort of get it now. I mean, so that's a lot. The fire hose was coming at me, and I, I had a teacup, and it was like, I mean, that's all I got. So you could either try to, you know, memorize this message, or there's, I even left out a bunch of stuff too. But, you know, but you're like, how do I explain this to myself or other people? You could, do, you could try to recount this whole message, or you could do what Jesus told his disciples to do, which is this. On the night of his betrayal, Jesus took bread and gave thanks, and he broke it. Broke it. This is my body, which is, for, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this, is, this cup is the new covenant, there's our word, in my blood, which is poured out for you. There's this whole picture that's embedded in this bread and this cup and it's an ancient story that tells about how this God intended to rescue his people even from their darkest stuff and it culminates in the person of Jesus and it tells the story just in the bread and the cup these these five words how Jesus died for our sins in this new covenant at the heart of Jesus ministry is that statement Some of you are like, I'm not sure about the Bible still, but that might have put a lot of closure on at least the idea of what Jesus believes about himself. And some of you, this might be a moment for you where you go, okay, I'm I'm choosing to believe this now. I don't have all the answers, like nobody nobody here has all the answers, but that is that is that's the clarity I needed. And for you, maybe this is a moment where you just simply say, you don't know what the magic prayer is, there's no magic prayer. Just simply this, I believe Jesus. I needed you, I confess that I needed you, that you are who you say you are, and I don't understand all of it, but yes, I believe. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna have a moment to receive communion, to take in that picture of the bread and the cup that tells the whole story of Jesus' ministry, the culminating moments of the entire Bible, which meets right there at the cross. Let's pray together. Jesus, we're grateful that you give us a simple symbol that tells the whole story. And while we have lots of questions and nothing is really ever fully answered for us and we still worry about all kinds of things, Father, we're grateful that you have taken on the responsibility to bear the burden of our own breaking of this covenant relationship with you, our own breaking of our quote-unquote marriage vows to you. And you give us a picture of it in the bread and the cup that tells the whole story. And Father, these words in the Bible, they're strange to us, but the bread and the cup, those are simple and clear. And Father, we freely receive those now. And so would you hear our confession to you, our needing of your rescuing power, your grace, your goodness, your love. 
And so Jesus, we give you this time right now to receive and celebrate communion. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Instructions for communion are on the screen. I'll close this in a moment.
All hail King Jesus. Here's the king who comes and offers himself, upholding both ends of the covenant agreement between God and people, taking on that burden upon himself on the cross. And we remember that with the bread and the cup. So for all the complexity of the Bible and everything else that it is, the simplicity of the bread and the cup tells the story of Jesus and his ministry, what he's intending. And so as we, we conclude, would you just hold out your hands? I'm going to read you some words from Peter, who just, he's really quoting a lot of the, the Hebrew scriptures, and he's writing this about Jesus, and might these words be a blessing to you. Speaking of Jesus, he says, He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. And when they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who, justice, who judges justly. He bore our sins on himself and his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Might we receive the grace that comes in this picture of the bread and the cup. Might we return to the shepherd and overseer of our souls. And whatever it is that you face, whatever joy or triumph or sorrow or tragedy, whatever gladness you might experience this week, might the love of the Father and the grace of the Son and the fellowship and comfort of the Holy Spirit be among you all. In Jesus' name, amen. So great to be with you folks. If you have needs for prayer, people would love to pray with you. We'll see you guys next week. God bless you.